Good morning, folks. Um, Today we are joined by Alexander Bokovi. He's a senior, uh, senior principal software engineer at Red Hat, working on things security related and identity management. Today he'll be talking about um, how the next release of Fedora 39 is planning on providing basic functionality of passwordless authentication. Over to you, Alexander. Yes, thank you. So we, we don't have actually anyone in the room yet because the um, keynote is still happening. So it, it, it will be a, a bit awkward. Uh, so I'm, I'm as if, oh, actually there are people coming. Great. Um, I, I was about to start saying that I'm doing a remote <laughs> presentation. <laughs> yeah, but um, the first two came in just at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> so um, this talk um, is a variation on um, a few talks that I gave earlier this year. And um, I, I gave a talk at uh, FOSDEM in February. Um, and then in May um, at the uh, Samba XP conference. And this is the third one, and it's like it's a progress talk uh, because the work is being done um, in the upstreams um, and in distributions to um, implement all of what I will be talking about. And that one is kind of the things are changing. The target is uh, also changing over time. So let me uh, start with um, a, a bit of description, who am I? So I'm working at Red Hat on uh, all things related to identity management. Um, basically, um, anything around uh, free APAs, this is the uh, Samba and uh, Kerberos, that's me or my team. I'm at Red Hat for 12 years now, uh, so um, there's a lot of uh, history uh, um, in, in the work that I will be describing today. And um, in fact, um, we kind of going back uh, with all of this, um, actually 30, almost 35 years uh, into 80s. And I will be talking about that one at the uh, progress we have today in, in um, free APA and related components and uh, the future. So what will happen in Fedora 39 and later because it's still uh, not, not everything is ready there. So past. Um, if we look into the um, past, and past is literally like uh, last 30 years for sure, the uh, assumptions that we had um, on the um, operating system level were that you, you really have more or less compatible um, authentication mechanisms everywhere. So when you try to log into the system, you expect that the system actually configured the same way you expecting it to, to be uh, used. So if it's not uh, a system that uses the uh, centralized um, identity management, then um, you, you have to make sure that it has all the same user databases, all the same passwords and or other, other parts. And um, you really want to be able to transfer these state of authentication from one system to another. So people went long way trying to solve this problem and for absolute majority of them, only two of those survived. It's typically use of the, um, some sort of um, authentication agents that store your previously authenticated kind of credentials and consult over the um, network. This is typical case for SSH, for example. When you do login over SSH, you kind of have a chance to use uh, authentication agent on, on your original system and get access to it piped through 
um, there, there was recently a CV actually in SSH, open, open SSH, that um, exploited this nature of the authentication agent by uh, triggering a lot of um, literally anything into the authentication engine on your system, like on your laptop, uh, while you're trying to log in into the um, uh, remote server. So these things, uh, security-wise, they, they have um, ups and downs, even though certain implementations exist like for decades. And a typical approach is literally you log in on your, let's say, desktop or laptop, you unlock your secrets manager, be it authentication agent for SSH or it's uh, your desktop, like GNOME desktop, and then you use these secrets to use the um, authentication agent and then consume resources based on the secrets, right? There's a bunch of application-specific issues. Li literally, uh, you can choose any area, you will find problems related to that, but the most important problem is uh, when you get, um, you get to go and access resources that out of the scope of the protocol. So you want SSH uh, agent to be used or SSH keys to be used, but you, you need to access file system. Go find a file system implementation like NFS or uh, SMB or any other that actually uses SSH as your authentication method, no. So you have to use something else there. And typically it's a the password or um, use of uh, things like Kerberos because Kerberos is another way of transferring your authentication state uh, using the mechanism of um, issuing cert uh, service tickets and then presenting these service tickets between the um, applications that operate on the client side, on the server side, and, and so on. So it's important um, that in the Kerberos case, a long time ago, I think more than 30 years ago, the decision was made to actually split a state we have the initial authentication from the actual use of the authenticated uh, kind of concept. So initial authentication can happen using whatever method you and uh, your key distribution center agree with. And um, over years these methods were developed um, in like maybe 20 years ago or so the use of smart cards became more or less standard uh, way of uh, passwordless, so to say, authentication uh, in Kerberos, and that's the one used, for example, by the majority of governmental customers. Um, that simply means uh, you use uh, a, a, a smart card device and you use uh, PKCS 11 um, smart cards to um, prove your identity, KDC, to issue um, a ticket granting ticket that contains some information about you that you can use later to ask for service tickets to a particular services. And that one is actually a fairly good mechanism because once you got the ticket, you present it every time you need to talk to a new service and until this ticket is valid, uh, you don't need to reacquire your initial kind of credential, uh, use your initial credentials. That builds up the idea of a single sign-on because you really signed once. Whether this signed once happens at the uh, login screen on the um, desktop or it happens well, through some other mechanism, um, it's secondary. It's the part of the user experience that you build up there. But um, this whole thing works like fairly, fairly well. And uh, the interesting part is that um, in Free APA and in Fedora specifically, we do have this for like almost 10 years now. Um, 
if we look at the um, complex things that you can do with this, is what um, Free APA is doing uh, when when you enable trust to Active Directory. This is the uh, typical authentication flow um, that that you would see there. This is from actually rel documentation, and um, it it just shows that when you're trying to log in over SSH, you get asked the password. That password, well, if there is a password. Uh, need to use there. It goes into the uh, PAM and through the PAM stack, SSSD kind of captures this and acquires a Kerberos ticket for you and on the login to the shell you will get uh, that Kerberos ticket which you can use later. But what's happening behind is a, is a whole machinery of um, different components being involved and one of them is Actually, let me try to show here uh, is P11 child. That's the one that actually goes with the smart card reader if the one exists and configured and so on. So these are typical things. Uh, you can see that this smart card reader is more or less on the client side. You don't need to get it uh, connected to the server side and so on. But um, if we look into the past, actually in 2016, I gave sort of similar um, presentations um, for the uh, enterprise desktop with um, GNOME and, and FreeAPA. Um, also at, at the FLOG, I think it was Krakow, in Krakow. Um, and we used their FreeAPA to log in into GNOME environment and we work it with the GNOME guys to extend GNOME uh, to support all of this. And this look at like, the whole thing look at like this. This is, um, I think, a VM at that point. So I'm logging in with the um, password, just a password, to uh, obtain a ticket you can see I have a ticket, this is like 2016, and then I use that ticket to um, come up with the uh, VPN connection, and that VPN connection was obtained using uh, Kerberos credentials, so you got the uh, service ticket to my open connect VPN endpoint, that, that side. And, and the next step was actually using the application which is um, IPA management tool to um, add, since this user can support, uh, can use OTP, to add the YubiKey uh, based second factor and instead of being asked for the password, be asked for um, actual first factor and second factor from this YubiKey. Um, as soon as I added that YubiKey, I can now uh, lock the screen and next attempt uh, to log in will ask me for factors. So now this is not just a password. It's sort of passwordless in the sense that um, the, um, whatever was your password becomes your uh, one of the factors to, to enter. But the same way you can do smart cards and so on, it's, it's kind of um, the thing that exists in uh, Free APA and in Fedora since 2015 or so. And this is a new ticket now, not the old one. You can see the, um, I need to stop this. <laughs> because this is the next one. Um, and you can use that for a lot of stuff. So we did a bunch of um, integrations. We did the um, integration uh, with the GNOME accounts uh, so that if you have this Kerberos ticket obtained through the login, whatever method was there, then GNOME accounts tracks it and renews if, if needed, uh, then um, GNOME browser at that point and later Firefox and later uh, Chrome uh, all uh, obtain the uh, functionality to support um, single sign-on using Kerberos. Uh, that, that came in 2015-2016 together with the uh, um, Fedora and others. And
And um, yeah, that was kind of the base for all of this work. Um, you could use this everywhere, whether it's in the uh, um, at, at work, like enterprise or at home. Um, this has like enabled many people to go there. Um, what happened, though, from from that time, was that um, we effectively uh, um, stopped we as as a society effectively stopped using the um, infrastructure as a as a driving factor for how we work. We switched it from um, infrastructure for applications. Uh, we we switched it from infrastructure for people to infrastructure for applications. You don't care whether your laptop is actually enrolled into the work space. You know, most likely using some browser as access to access the resources that are provided by applications on your workplace. Um, six, seven years ago, that wasn't true. You have to have your system enrolled. You use resources on your domain and, and so on. The change came actually with the profound um, use of the mobile devices, and actually phones killed everything else in in terms of also application development and frameworks and so on. So things became increasingly. Uh, new mainframe-ish in the sense that the browser became a new sort of mainframe, um, ubiquitous in, in terms of uh, use and access and so on. And for the um, authentication and most importantly authorization of the uh, applications, people switch to uh, two set of uh, standards and framework of all these uh, flows. And uh, to any organizations, what happened is basically if you integrate new applications, you, you integrate with the um, uh, OAuth. You bring your authentication into the authorization framework provided by the OAuth. Um, and this is important part. So, okay, if my laptop is not anymore um, really on the network, I probably not on the network that is trusted by the uh, um, domains and so on. Then how I do trust all of this? This whole change actually went event eventually went into the situation that is um, outlined in so sort uh, so called zero trust architecture, where effectively um, organizations are said and be enforced by the governments around the world to say that uh, we don't trust our infrastructure anymore. We have to validate every single thing that happens there, but we also don't trust um, neither uh, end user devices nor uh, we trust our applications. So it, it kind of changed the game. And the uh, idea with this is not a new one. It's basically a statement of facts. Everybody is doing that uh, in, the, in the world, and they have to reapply at the boundary where the application is run and reapply this change of kind of see if the things are right, authorize every single access, and so on. So what we get is, yeah, really, things switch to be a browser. And this story is actually uh, similar to what we had in 2016, except that um, in 2016, we, we dealt with uh, environments where we had captive portals. Every, even today here, you have a captive portal to get on the um, hotel network. You have to solve this uh, captive portal thing. And in 2016, one of the problems that we outlined was about the same. So, okay, if I want to log in, in into my laptop with my enterprise credentials, uh, I need to be on the network. But in order to be on the network, before I log in, I have to solve the capture uh, portal. 
and I cannot solve it because, well, it's, it's meaning running um, untrusted code on a system with pretty much root privileges uh, because of how a system works. Um, this is not Linux only problem. This problem is everywhere. So some time ago I was talking with Microsoft engineers who were implementing Live.com and whatever is called now Azure uh, or Entra ID, whatever um, method uh, that they use to log into Azure and other resources. And they say they had the same issue. Uh, running an unconfined page to log in into the um, environment before the um, you log in into the machine is a, a constant pain. Um, and to solve it, uh, there is no real solution other than really running isolated scratched environment. They tried to provide like filtering um, on the uh, level of what URIs are supported. But federation as a part of the uh, OAuth space kills it all. So if I want to log in, let's say, to um, Red Hat's um, single sign-on system, I go to sso.redhat.com. And there I say that I want to log in with my Google stuff. So it actually forwards me to the Google page. So from the perspective of, of the um, login uh, system like GDM or Windows login system. Now I am dealing with the content that might from the Google forward to another resource that actually handles my authentication if I never gave the credentials to Google when I created Google account. It's like there is simply not possible to solve this uh, in a safe and sane way. So we didn't solve that problem for captive portals because that's exactly the same thing. Um, we did not solve this yet uh, for uh, today's kind of login in, in this uh, online services thingy. Uh, again, I'm talking about the login to the uh, session first and then using the browser. We don't have yet browser running in. And the problem is really the same, how to bridge these things together. How we get there? Uh, we started with um, the other side. So looking in, into the um, environments, uh, we realized that, okay, you have a browser somewhere. You really have a browser in your device. And if it's an online service that you have to authenticate with, then probably, um, you can run it on the other device to log in here. So in Free IPA, we implemented last year, um, and it's available in Fedora uh, 37 and RHEL um, 8, 7, I think, and later. Um, uh, you can instruct um, users to visit the um, OAuth to base it identity provider and authorize the access. So we did some sort of a magic, which is based on the device authorization grant uh, flow, described it in the RFC 8628, um, which is similar to how you authorize um, your TV to use your YouTube account, sign into YouTube. Here you sign in into your SSH server, but really not into the server, you're signing in in your Kerberos environment. Instead of uh, doing this every time, you get the Kerberos ticket and then continue using the Kerberos ticket. So this looks like uh, this. There's a lot of uh, flow things happening, but I will, let me, let me show you I really hope it will work. Yes. So this, this looks like this. So um, I use Keyclock here as OAuth uh, to identity provider. 
and this user is um, authenticated with the um, password first. So now I don't have a security key, which is the um, uh, FIDO2 key associated with it, but I want to associate, so I uh, register it. You can see I'm using the browser here on the other system. Other system, in this case, of course, these are running on the same system, but it doesn't matter. I created this um, key, so basically web auth and uh, kind of authentication here. And I configured Keyclog to use WebAuth and authentication if the user is there. And then when I try to SSH to the um, system, I get asked uh, of this um, prompt that says, hey, go to this URI and confirm that you want to access this environment. And as a user, I get to log in there and uh, use a security key to log in. Of course, the um, Firefox asks me to confirm whether I want to use this key and then uh, asks me to confirm that I want to log in into the system. So I logged into the system, I got the Kerberos key. So what happened here is I traded WebAuth and authentication somewhere at some other place um, into authorization to uh, access the uh, token, uh, user info token on, on this user on that I, I identity provider. And I use that fact as uh, action to issue uh, ticket grant and ticket in Kerberos. So it's Starting from here, I can use Kerberos ticket for everything else I need because this is the ticket grant and ticket. I can trade it for other services. Of course, doing this every time is, is kind of weird. And the most weird part is, of course, I cannot do this in the login because you, you see the size of the URI. Uh, I cannot really uh, even display it in GDM. It will be cut <coughs> off at the beginning. So authenticate at HTT and then the rest will be cut off. You wouldn't see nothing basically there. So we need to do something to uh, kind of fix this. Okay. Um, but can we actually go and get away from the networking? Because this really wants to have this networking thing to happen. Um, let's see if I can do that. So this is a relatively recent uh, demo that I made at Samba XP where I basically uh, took the uh, FIDA2 token and used it to log in, in into the GNOME environment. It still cuts off some information. Luckily, in this case, the important one is to enter a PIN and effectively uh, um, ask the user to uh, validate their presence by touching the device is what uh, you really uh, need, and it's shown. So it, it works. This is um, actually a rawhide at that point, uh, but you need a special version of free IPA, which is not in Rawhide yet. Um, it's, at this point, um, everything is in the free IPA upstream already, but not released. We are gonna release this maybe in a couple of weeks. And so, so this is how I log in on this machine as well already. And it works um, also with the um, environments where you don't have networking access. The only thing that is needed is to provision a local account uh, information that SSSD keeps in the cache uh, about this user, but the information comes from the network. And so you, you need to be at least once in the network to get there. And um, so this is um, good. I, I get the um, Kerberos ticket and that's, that's great. Um, it will be a, kind of configurable the same way we do this configuration in the rest of IPA uh, 
authentication type. So you can see that you can do the um, OTP in the same way I did in 2016. You can do a smart cards, that's PKI in it, public key infrastructure use. You can do external IDP provider like I show it in the demo before this one. Um, or you can use the FIDO2 uh, based tokens, which we call pass keys intentionally because we support anything that Leap FIDO2 supports and, and Leap FIDO2 plans to also support the uh, um, Bluetooth based ones and, and the, uh, these um, whatever Android and iOS are supporting, but they are not supportable yet. Well, we, we will get there at some point. And it's also a bit complex scheme, but it's built on the same uh, architecture we use for other stuff. So it's a radius um, backend to Kerberos that simulates certain things. It, it just uses radius protocol between Kerberos, KDC, and itself but it doesn't use other radio stuff. So it's kind of a, a way to extend things. We built up this, um, I think in 2012 or 13, to support um, the um, two-factor authentication in IPA for the Kerberos and for the rest, but it's also used for all the other stuff. And um, the same technology can be used also for enabling Samba AD. Well, there's dependency on MIT Kerberos, so it, it will not work with Heimdall. That's, that's fine, because they don't have uh, um, pluggable uh, mechanisms uh, for all these methods. We only have them for MIT Kerberos. Um, and uh, of course, right now it, it doesn't, but I mean, extending use of IPA infra um, to plug behind the um, Samba AD uh, is possible because it's, it's just the LDAP storage of uh, certain bits and then the same um, utilities can be used to manipulate it. Um, so that's in my plans. Again, not Red Hat, but my is upstream plans to have this support. Um, but then another problem is what to target. So if we talk about this, this is not going to be supported by Microsoft. So Windows systems are out of um, this story. They are not going to work on anything like this. You can extend um, authentication packages in, in Windows and provide your own, but written that for certain things um, is a bit cumbersome and uh, it's really where you want to have uh, customers because it's, it's a lot of uh, work to do. Um, so targeting Linux systems we can and we will probably uh, target them uh, given that now with the uh, um, Fedora um, OpenQA uh, support and the uh, um, testing of Samba AD, we can actually test the whole cycle in OpenQA from the client system login and go in there. The same way for both Free APA and Samba AD once it went in there. That's the beauty of um, the architecture we have in OpenQA. So for the um, desktop integration, the bigger kind of uh, thing is, uh, of course, inadequacy of the um, UI in, well, in this case in GDM, but it's really extended to other um, desktop environments as well. They are inadequate to anything but like passwords. The uh, GDM is um, more advanced here because we work it together with the um, GNOME folks um, and they cover a few other methods as well. So for the smart cards, for example, in 2019, we extended GDM to uh, allow kind of choose which smart card to use for which account to map into and so on. And we kind of work now uh, with uh, them to design how all this extends for all of these methods, not just the one, because we need to cover um, 
the login with external identity provider. We need to cover pass keys. We need to, for the pass keys, some of them, um, like the physically ones, um, they work already. Uh, so we just need to have a bit of nicer UI. But the, um, uh, the uh, phone-based pass keys, they will require scanning uh, QR codes from the screen, and that means also enabling uh, this triangle kind of connection between the different services to discover what, what to negotiate with and so on. So this is like, uh, you need to have an infra. And if you want to expand this beyond just one desktop environment, it needs to be um, more or less um, independent of just one. So there's a lot of discussion ongoing. It's not, most of it not public, because uh, in the uh, initial steps, we, we have to kind of collaborate tightly um, over the things. But some of it already can be seen in the um, um, GNOME's uh, GitLab uh, environment. There are some branches, there are tickets open, and so on. So let me show how this looks like. Um, this is the um, a proof of concept. It's not a, a full working thing. Um, Ray Strode, who maintains GDM, he wrote a proof of concept for both GDM side and he wrote a special PAM module that kind of interoperates with it. It's not part of SSSD, but it's just a separate module to test the proof of concept thingy. So this is um, a, a login with the like imaginary user that has uh, actual authentication associated with some external identity provider. And uh, when this user tries to log in, it gets to, sh uh, gets to see this uh, uh, different dialogue that says, okay, uh, continue to initiate web login and authenticate with an external device. And when the user um, touches these um, left, right, angles, uh, arrows, then you proceed in the flow. So this kind of says, okay, you can get back and choose another authentication mechanism, or you can go forward. Um, it's already different from uh, what was before. It, it's not necessarily the final one, but we kind of been discussing this with the UX people. So in this case, once you proceed, a, a request is being made and the uh, new authentication URL is generated, so then converted into the uh, um, QR code. And then once you did all your uh, job, you press the next uh, button and you get login, if you're right. At this point, when you logged in, you get the Kerberos ticket issued. Okay, not in this proof of concept, of course, but the, uh, in the uh, real environment, if you run with this, you get the Kerberos ticket issued. Um, <clears throat> and then, again, you can use this for, for the rest. In the browser, in the other applications, um, uh, mounting your home directory, actually, uh, and so on. But uh, there are other things. There is a lot of... Um, um, other things. So, for example, in the real life, you often have to log in, for example, with this token. You want to log in, but you don't have a network. Okay, you can do that. But how you differentiate this case for the user to say that your single sign-on experience will not be there? Yes, you, you are logged in because you are allowed to log in offline. But we need to tell them, we need to pop up some information, we need to differentiate whether this was a graphical login so that this information, this warning will be a pop-up somewhere. And we need to show the message in a console if it was a SSH, for example, login and you unable, were unable to get the things in and so on. So this is a lot of uh, UX work uh, and improvement on that one. Uh, to get these things done. And then, this is where the hard thing comes in. It all has to work together. It's not just one project doing their job or two projects. 
or three projects, you have to coordinate how things are delivered to and appear together in the distribution. That's how we work in, uh, with the Fedora. Uh, typical, we don't advertise most of this work um, because, um, well, uh, coordinating is hard enough. Promising something when every party can sleep and um, delay their delivery is also impossible. So in the true open source fashion, it's ready when it's done. That's, that's how we work. Um, but um, there's, we are not the only ones who are doing this. So there's a lot of parallel efforts from overall community. So there are people who are looking at how to get the, uh, uh, these pass keys information shared uh, across uh, different execution environments. So how to get them in uh, flat packs without exposing everything. How to get these details back and forth in, in different places. Um, most of them is not using Kerberos, so not really relying on Kerberos. So we are not overlapping with uh, anyone. We kind of uh, getting this puzzle solved, uh, a piece here, a piece there, and then combining these uh, efforts together. So, for example, I know that Systemd has uh, some support for FIDA2 integration through Leap FIDA2. So we have some hopeful things that the uh, definitions of these um, pass keys in free API could eventually be used to sign in the um, uh, encryption of the disk drive and secure boot and, and all of these things together. Uh, at the same time, um, <clears throat> we hope, and, and that would be interesting to see how you can actually get this to pre-boot environment um, and get this booting happen. You have to cache some data that SSSD provides. You have to use it uh, beyond uh, this kind of um, network-able uh, environments and so on. So this is a lot of work and it's not like the thing that is um, the whole experience is delivered in a single release. It may well take several releases to complete all this delivery. So I know that the uh, GNOME parts wouldn't be ready until maybe March next year uh, if we are happy with what we get which I heard we are not yet. So there is still discussion across um, us and uh, um, GNOME developers from other distributions how to get all these things um, working together. But the basics are there and I'm really um, excited that actually it works. So I, I do log in in my system here with it and I can actually show you it here as a sort of a, um, an environment. I locked the system. So this is using PAM for VLOG um, authentication. So now I can unlock the system. It starts blinking on my device because I enabled the user verification. And I did verify it, I'm oh, sorry. And you probably see that my ticket is old. Oh, this is actually a different one. This is the Red Hat one. And let me switch to mine. Is this 12.15? 1215 here. That's the new one. This is also, um, I'm not on the VPN to my home system, but this Kerberos uh, environment uses um, so-called KDC proxy mechanism. So it's proxying over HTTPS to, to my environment, similar how we use in Fedora for Kerberos login. That's why the login works, but I'm Officially, I'm offline in terms of uh, IPA and SSD environment. So that thing is 
is here. Uh, let me grab Uh, okay, this will not wor wouldn't work because I don't have the uh, uh, VPN, right? Okay, let me let me log in there. Why why don't is this up? So I do have now a VPN connection. I can actually run it. Yeah, so there is a passkey mapping in my IPA account for, well, this is my home setup, so it's, it's like, um, and this, one of these keys there, you can see there are multiple of them registered. I'm just guinea pig in myself with all of this thing. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the, um, as, as far as we are, um, but really it's enabling you to do all this stuff. One thing I did not say is that I can now use um, this Kerberos ticket or any Kerberos ticket to actually uh, uh, authenticate not just to any other system, and that's really SSH to other system, right? But I can use this to <clears throat> authenticate uh, as a part of the uh, um, PAM authentication on the same machine, which makes possible things like uh, if you have a Kerberos ticket, you can do sudo, base it not on the password or entering again into the authorization cycle, but with uh, your Kerberos ticket. Uh, this is supported in, in Fedora and RHEL for about two years now. It's in the documentation. Uh, you can actually tune SSSD to um, specify which Kerberos ticket uh, can be used for that. So you can say that the Kerberos ticket obtained with the passkey is the one that I'm allow it to use for Raisin sudo. Just password will not work. Just like anything else will not work. Only if I use FIDO2 or I use smart card. And that kind of thing is already um, in Fedora. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking myself um, for a couple months now that I should write down an article this, about all of this because many of these things, they exist, but they are not discoverable, right? Uh, of course, we have this in the uh, humongous uh, REL ID um, documentation, but go find things there. That's another um, part of the story. But yeah, this is uh, all I have. And if you have any questions, I think we have maybe five minutes or so. Thank you. Okay, so I have a few questions, so I'll try to take one question, and then if somebody wants to ask, they can ask, and then I will go back and forth. So <laughs> for your first demo, um, when you were using the YubiKey, and you did configure the YubiKey through the, um, I think it was uh, free IPA, well, this is an, an OAuth, or um, the token, what kind of token did it use there? Because it wasn't an F FID uh, feed or two. Uh, you're talking about the first demo? Yes. The first demo from 2016 yes. was using um, YubiKey with TOTP. Yeah, the TOTP here was just um, the, um, uh, the six digits, right? Yeah. I, don't, I, I don't recall the exact technical term yeah, yeah, yeah. for it. Yeah, okay, that, so that was it. This is good, how it got configured because the YubiKey need to have the secret for this. Yeah, this is integrated in free API. Uh, it will configure the UP key yeah, and yeah. okay. You can um, you can set up it um, with like software one or you can set up with UP key and, and so on. The secret is actually if you don't use this special command that I had this uh, whatever o, uh, o, OTP uh, at UP key. Um, if you don't use that one. Um, it will print you a QR code and it will print you a secret 
uh, there that you will use to program your YubiKey manually. But um, if you have, um, if you use that command, it will use Python bindings to the YubiKey thing to program the USB device directly. So that's kind of transparent, um, but you need to run that command on the device where you configure it. Thank you. That that's kind of that that is the thing that exists for like forever now. Um, maybe you mentioned it. Um, I was a little bit distracted, so I apologize in advance if it was mentioned. Um, but is it possible to set this up uh, standalone uh, without a, a full-blown uh, free IPA uh, infrastructure? So. We are focusing on making this working with free APA on the first stage. Um, the um, client side, meaning SSSD side, only needs to have this information in the um, local database, the local cache that they have. Um, the information can be injected into the local database. They don't have utilities for that yet. There is um, SSS control, but it doesn't have uh, a mode to inject this. This is on the plans. We will, we will do that. The idea is to have a replacement for um, PAM UTF um, thingy uh, completely, because from our experience, PAM UTF is actually a bit insecure in terms of the uh, configuration management, and you really have to split these things. This is another part. Um, we need to provide the user utilities to um, make it nicer, manageable uh, for uh, common folk. Right now, it's more usable for the admins who know what they do. Excellent, and I'm looking forward to some nice uh, blog post or documentation. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, other questions? I already scratched one out, so. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> for the second demo, uh, when we're using key cloak with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with free IPA, you were using the key cloak interface to configure or fetch a ticket that will be added for the user, uh, as far as I understood when you clicked on configure secret. Uh, does this mean that the free IPA is your main ITP and then it just extended the authentication to a Kerberos server where you configure your Kerberos uh, environment, which is the free IPA in this case? This one is, is uh, all done through the Kerberos and only in free IPA. So you cannot do this. First, you cannot do this offline because you have to communicate with both um, Kerberos KDC and the K Kerberos KDC have to communicate with the uh, online identity provider. Um, so this requires Kerberos. Existing. You cannot configure this um, like standalone. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you.